ദ എവർലാസ്റ്റിംഗ് മാൻ ബൈ ജി കെ ചെസ്റ്റർടൺ എപ്പിസോഡ് ഫൈവ് പാർട്ട് വൺ സെക്ഷൻ ത്രീ ദ എൻറ്റിക്വിറ്റി ഓഫ് സിവിലൈസേഷൻ കണ്ടിന്യൂഡ് ബട്ട് ദർ ആർ ടു അതർ റീസൺസ് ഫർ ബിഗിനിങ് വിത്ത് ദ ടു ഫിക്സഡ് പോയിൻറ്റ്സ് ഓഫ് ഈജിപ്റ്റ് ആൻഡ് ബാബിലോൺ ഫർ വൺ തിങ് ദ ആർ ഫിക്സ്ഡ് ഇൻ ട്രഡീഷൻ ആസ് ദ ടൈപ്സ് ഓഫ് ആൻറ്റിക്വിറ്റി ആൻഡ് ഹിസ്റ്ററി വിത്തൗട്ട് ട്രഡീഷൻ ഈസ് ഡെഡ് ആൻഡ് ഹിസ്റ്ററി വിത്തൗട്ട് ട്രഡീഷൻ ഈസ് ഡെഡ് ആൻഡ് ഹിസ്റ്ററി വിത്തൗട്ട് ട്രഡീഷൻ ഈസ് ഡെഡ് ബാബിലോൺ ഈസ് സ്റ്റിൽ ദ ബേർഡൻ ഓഫ് എ നഴ്സറി റൈം and egypt with its enormous population of princesses awaiting reincarnation is still the topic of an unnecessary number of novels but a tradition is generally a truth so long as the tradition is sufficiently popular even if it is almost vulgar and there is a significance in this babylonian and egyptian element in nursery rhymes and novels even the newspapers normally so much behind the times have already got as far as the reign of tutankhamun the first reason is full of the common sense of popular legend it is the simple fact that we do know more of these traditional things than of other contemporary things and that we always did all travelers from herodotus to lord carnarvon follow this route scientific speculations of today do indeed spread out a map of the whole primitive world with streams of racial emigration or admixture marked in dotted lines everywhere over spaces which the unscientific medieval map maker would have been content to call terra incognita if he did not fill the inviting blank with a picture of a dragon to indicate the probable reception given to pilgrims but these speculations are only speculations at the best and at the worst the dotted lines can be far more fabulous than the dragon there is unfortunately one fallacy here into which it is very easy for men to fall even those who are most intelligent and perhaps especially those who are most imaginative it is the fallacy of supposing that because an idea is greater in the sense of larger therefore it is greater in the sense of more fundamental and fixed and certain if a man lives alone in a straw hut in the middle of tibet he may be told that he is living in the chinese empire and the chinese empire is certainly a splendid and spacious and impressive thing or alternatively he may be told that he is living in the british empire and be duly impressed but the curious thing is that in certain mental states he can feel much more certain about the chinese empire that he cannot see than about the straw hut that he can see he has some strange magical juggle in his mind by which his argument begins with the empire though his experience begins with the hut sometimes he goes mad and appears to be proving that a straw hut cannot exist in the domains of the dragon throne that it is impossible for such a civilization as he enjoys to contain such a how well as he inhibits but his insanity arises from the intellectual slip of supposing 
that because China is a large and all embarrassing hypothesis therefore it is something more than a hypothesis now modern people are perpetually arguing in this way and they extend it to things much less real and certain than the Chinese Empire they seem to forget for instance that a man is not even certain of the solar system as he is certain of the South Downs the solar system is a deduction and doubtless a true deduction but the point is that it is a very vast and far-reaching deduction and therefore he forgets that it is a deduction at all and treats it as a first principle he might discover that the whole calculation is a miscalculation and the sun and stars and street lamps would look exactly the same but he has forgotten that it is a calculation and is almost ready to contradict the sun if it does not fit into the solar system if this is a fallacy even in the case of facts pretty well ascertained such as the solar system and the chinese empire it is an even more devastating fallacy in connection with theories and other things that are not really ascertained at all thus history especially prehistoric history has a horrible habit of beginning with certain generalizations certain generalizations about races i will not describe the disorder and misery this inversion has produced in modern politics because the race is vaguely supposed to have produced the notion men talk as if the notion were something vaguer than the race because they have themselves invented a reason to explain a result they almost deny the result in order to justify the reason they first treat a celt as an axiom and then treat an irishman as an inference and then they are surprised that the great that a great fighting roaring irishman is angry at being treated as an inference they cannot see that the irish are irish whether or no whether or not they are celtic whether or not there ever were any celts and what misleads them once more is the size of the theory the sense that the fancy is bigger than the fact a great scattered celtic race is supposed to contain the irish so of course the irish must depend for their very existence upon it the same confusion of course has eliminated the english and the germans by swamping them in the teutonic race and some try to prove from the races being at one that the nations could not be at war but i only give these vulgar and hackneyed examples in passing as more familiar examples of the fallacy as more familiar examples of the fallacy the matter at issue here is not its application to this modern things but rather to the most ancient things but the more remote and unrecorded was the racial problem the more fixed was this curious inverted certainty in the victorian man of science to this day it gives a man of the scientific traditions the same sort of shock to questions these things which were only the last inferences when he turned them into first principles he is still more certain that he is an aryan even then that he is an anglo-saxon just as he is more certain that he is an anglo-saxon than that he is an englishman he has never really discovered that he is a european but he has never doubted that he is an indo-european these victorian theories have shifted a great deal in their shape and scope but this habit of a rapid hardening of a hypothesis into a theory and of a theory into an assumptions has and a theory into an as into an assumption has hardly yet gone out of fashion people cannot easily get rid of the mental confusion of feeling that the foundations of history must surely be secure that the first that the first steps must be safe that the biggest general that the biggest generalization must be obvious but though the contradiction may seem to them a paradox this is the very contrary of the truth 
it is the large thing that is secret and invisible it is the small thing that is evident and enormous every race on the face of the earth has been the subject of these speculations and it is impossible even to suggest an outline of the subject but if we take the european race alone its history or rather its prehistory has undergone many retrospective revolutions in the short period of my own lifetime it used to be called the caucasian race and i read in childhood an account of its collision with the mongolian race it was written by brett harte and opened with the query or is the caucasian played out apparently the caucasian was played out for in a very short time he had been turned into the indo-european man sometimes i regret to say proudly presented as the indo-german man it seems that the hindu and the german have similar words for mother or father there were other similarities between sanskrit and other western tongues and with that all superficial differences between a hindu and a german seemed suddenly to disappear generally this composite person was more conveniently described as the aryan and the really important point was that he had marched westward out he has he had marched westward out of those highlands of india where fragments of his language could still be found when i read this as a child i had the fancy that after all the aryan need not have marched westward and left his language behind him he might also have marched eastward and taken his language with him if i were to read it now i should content myself with confessing my ignorance of the whole matter but as a matter of fact i have great difficulty in reading it now because it is not being written now it looks as if the aryan is also played out anyhow he has not merely changed his name but changed his address his starting place and his route of travel one new theory maintains that our race did not come to its present home from the east but from the south some say the europeans did not come from asia but from africa some have even had the wild idea that the europeans came from europe or rather they have never left it then there is a certain amount of evidence of a more or less prehistoric pressure from the north such as that which seems to have brought the greeks to inherit the Cretan culture and so often brought the Gauls over the hills into the fields in Italy. But I merely mention this example of European ethnology to point out that the learned have pretty well boxed the compass by this time and that I who am not one of the learned cannot pretend for a moment to decide where such doctors disagree but i can use my own common sense and i sometimes fancy that this is a little rusty from want of use the first act of common sense is to recognize the difference between a cloud and a mountain and i will affirm that nobody knows any of these things in the sense that we all know of the existence of the pyramids of egypt the truth it may be repeated is that what we really see as distinct from what we may reasonably guess in this earliest phase of history is darkness covering the earth and great darkness the peoples with a light or two gleaming here and there on chance patches of humanity and that two of these flames do burn upon two of these tall primeval towns upon the high terraces of babylon and the huge pyramids of the nile there are indeed other ancient lights or lights that may be conjectured to be very ancient in very remote parts of the vast wilderness of night far away to the east there is a high civilization of vast antiquity in china 
There are the remains of civilizations in Mexico and South America and other places. Some of them apparently so high in civilization as to have reached the most refined forms of devil worship. But the difference lies in the element old tradition. The tradition of these lost cultures has been broken off and though the tradition of China still lives, it is doubtful whether we know anything about it. Moreover, a man trying to measure the Chinese antiquity has to use Chinese traditions of measurement and he has a strange sensation of having passed into another world under other laws of time and space. Time is telescoped outwards and centuries assume the slow and stiff movement of ions. The white man trying to see it as the yellow man sees feels as if his head were turning round and wonders wildly whether it is growing a pigtail. Anyhow, he cannot take in a scientific sense that queer perspective that leads up to the primeval pagoda of the first of the sons of heaven. He is the real antipodes, the only true alternative world to Christendom and he is after a fashion walking upside down. I have spoken of the medieval map maker and his dragon, but what medieval traveler, however much interested in monsters, would expect to find a country where a dragon is a benevolent and amiable being? Of the more serious side of Chinese tradition, something will be said in another connection, but I am only talking of tradition and the test of antiquity and I only mention China as an antiquity that is not for us reached by a bridge old tradition and Babylon and Egypt as antiquities that are Herodotus is a human being in a sense in which a China man in a belly cock hat sitting opposite to us in a London tea shop is hardly human. We feel as if we knew what David and Isaiah felt like in a way in which we never were quite certain what Lee Hung Chang felt like. The very sins that snatched away Helen or Bathsheba have passed into a proverb of private human weakness of pathos and even of pardon. The very virtues of the Chinamen have about them something terrifying. This is the difference made by the destruction or preservation of a continuous historical inheritance as for ancient Egypt to modern Europe. But when we ask what was that world that we inherit and why those particular people and places seem to belong to it, we are led to the central fact of civilized history. That center was the Mediterranean, which was not so much a piece of water as a world, but it was a world with something of the character of such a water, for it became more and more a place of unification in which the streams of strange and very diverse cultures met. The Nile and the Tiber alike flow into the Mediterranean, so did the Egyptian and the Etrurian ally contribute to a Mediterranean civilization. The glamour of the great sea spread indeed very far inland and the unity was felt among the Arabs alone in the deserts and the Gauls beyond the northern hills. But the gradual building up of a common culture running around all the coasts of this inner sea is the main business of antiquity. As will be seen, it was sometimes a bad business as well as a good business. In that Orbis terrarum or circle of plants, there were the extremes of evil and of pity. There were contrasted races and still more contrasted religions. It was the scene of an endless struggle between Asia and Europe. From the night of the Persian ships 
at Salamis to the point of the Turkish ships at Lepanto. It was the scene as will be more especially suggested later of a supreme spiritual struggle between the two pieces of paganism confronting each other in the Latin and Phoenician cities. In the Roman Forum and the Punic Mart, it was the world of war and peace, the world of good and evil, the world of all that matters most, with all respect to the Aztecs and the Mongols of the Far East, they did not matter as the Mediterranean tradition mattered and still matters. Between it and the Far East there were, of course, interesting cults and conquests of various kinds, and more or less it touched with it and in proportion as they were so intelligible also to us. The Persians came riding it to make an end of Babylon and we are told in a Greek story how these barbarians learned to draw the bow and tell the truth. Alexander the Great Greek marched with his Macedonians into the sunrise and brought back strange birds colored like the sunrise clouds and strange flowers and jewels from the gardens and treasuries of the nameless of nameless kings islam went eastward into the world and made it partly imaginable to us precisely because islam itself was born in that circle of lands that fringed our own ancient and ancestral sea in the Middle Ages, the empire of the Mughals increased its majesty without losing its uh, mystery. The Tartars conquered China and the Chinese apparently took very little notice of them. All these things are interesting in themselves, but it is impossible to shift the, but it is impossible to shift the center of gravity to the inland spaces of Asia from the inland sea of Europe. When all is said, if there were nothing in the world but what was said and done and written and built in the lands lying around the Mediterranean, it would still be in all the most vital and valuable things the world in which we live, when that southern culture spread to the northwest, it produced many very wonderful things of which doubtless we ourselves are the most wonderful. When it spread thence to colonies and new countries, it was still the same culture. It was still the same culture so long as it was culture at all. But round that little sea, like a lake, were the things themselves, apart from all extension and echoes and commentaries on the things, the Republic and the Church, the Bible and the heroic epics, Islam and Israel and the memories of the lost empires, Aristotle and the measure of all things. It is because the first light upon this world is really light, the daylight in which we are still walking today and not merely the doubtful visitation of strange stars that I have begun here with noting where that light first falls on the towering cities of the Eastern Mediterranean. But though Babylon and Egypt have thus a sort of first claim in the very fact of being familiar and traditional, fascinating riddles to us but also fascinating riddles to our fathers, we must not imagine that they were the only old civilizations on the southern sea or that all the civilization was merely Sumerian or Semitic or Coptic, still less merely Asiatic or African. Real research is more and more exalting and real research is more and more exalting and 
real research is more and more exalting the ancient civilization of Europe and especially of what we may still vaguely call the Greeks. It must be understood in the sense that there were Greeks before the Greeks. As in so many of their mythologies, there were gods before the gods. The island of Crete was the center of the civilization now called Minoan after the Minos who lingered in ancient legend and those labyrinth was actually discovered by modern archaeology. This elaborate European society with its harbors and its uh, drainage and its domestic machinery seems to have gone down before some invasion of its northern neighbors who made or inherited the Hellas we know in history. But that earlier period did not pass till it had given the world gifts so great that the world has ever since been striving in vain to repay them if only by plagiarism. Somewhere along the Lonian coast opposite Crete and the islands was a town of some sort, probably of the sort that we should call a village or hamlet with a wall. It was called Ilion, but it came to be called Troy, and the name will never perish from the earth. A poet who may have been a beggar and a ballad monger who may have been unable to read and write and was described by tradition as a blind, composed a poem about the Greeks going to war with this town to recover the most beautiful woman in the world. That the most beautiful woman in the world lived in that one little town sounds like a legend. That the most beautiful poem in the world was written by somebody who knew of nothing larger than such little towns is a historical fact. It is said that the poem came at the end of the period, that the primitive culture brought it forth in its decay, in which case one would like to have seen that culture in its prime. But anyhow it is true that this, which is our first poem, might very well be our last poem too. It might well be the last word as well as the first word spoken by man about his mortal lot as seen by merely mortal vision. If the world becomes pagan and perishes, the last man left alive would do well to quote the Iliad and die. But in this one great human revelation of antiquity, there is another element of great historic importance. Which was hardly, which has hardly, I think, been given its proper place in history. The poet has so conceived the poem that his sympathies apparently, and those of his reader certainly, are on the side of the vanquished rather than of the victor. And this is a sentiment which increases in the poetical tradition even as the poetical origin itself recedes. Achilles had some status as a sort of demigod in pagan times, but he disappears altogether in late times. But Hector grows greater as the ages pass and it is his name that is the name of the the and it is his name that is the name of a knight of the round table and his sword that legend puts into the hand of Roland, laying about him with the weapon of the defeated Hector in the last ruin and splendor of his own defeat. The name anticipates all the defeats through which our race and religion were to pass. That survival of a hundred defeats, that is its triumph. The tale of the end of Troy shall have no ending 
for it is lifted up forever into living echoes immortal as our hopelessness and our hope Troy standing was a small thing that may have stood nameless for ages but Troy falling has been caught up in a flame and suspended in an immortal instant of annihilation and because it was destroyed with fire the fire shall never be destroyed and as with that and as with the city so with the hero and as with the city so with the hero traced in archaic lines in that primeval twilight is found the first figure of the night there is a prophetic coincidence in his title we have spoken of the word chivalry and how it seems to mingle the horseman with the horse it is almost anticipated ages before in the thunder of the homeric hexameter and that long leaping word with which the iliad ends it is that very unity for which we can find no name but the holy center of chivalry but there are other reasons for giving in this glimpse of antiquity the name upon the sacred town the sanctity of such towns ran like a fire round the coasts and islands of the northern mediterranean of the northern mediterranean the high fenced hamlet for which heroes died from the smallness of the city came the greatness of the citizen hellas with her hundred statues produced nothing statelier than that walking statue the ideal of the self commanding man hellas of the 100 statues was one legend and literature and all that labyrinth of little walled nations resounding with the lament of troy a later legend and after thought but not an ancient said that stragglers from troy founded a republic on the italian shore it was true in spirit that Republican virtue had such a root a mystery of honor that was not born of Babylon or the Egyptian pride there shone like the shield of Hector defying Asia and Africa till the light of a new day was loosened with the rushing of the eagles and the coming of the name the name that came like a thunder clap when the world woke to rome